is located. The problem with static routes though is that it doesn't really provide optimal routing and fast convergence, meaning that if an interface fails, that static routes doesn't have the ability of rerouting across a, a, a different path. However, just saying that, there is a feature that you can use called IPSLA. And it's a feature that allows you to configure a probe which will ping a particular IP address. This, this IPSLA, which is like a policy, would then be associated to a static route. So basically, if the probe is successful, that static route will, will remain active in the routing table. If the probe fails, then that means that it's unsuccessful and that, and that static route will be removed. So that can provide some kind of enhancements of your static routes, but not really providing optimal routing or fast convergence. And overall, in terms of larger environments, it's not recommended. If it's for a smaller environment with maybe two routing devices or a few subnets, stack routes are definitely um, recommended and can be used. Dynamic routing. Dynamic routing is more complex in terms of is more of its concepts and fundamentals. There's a lot more things you have to understand about that routing protocol's behavior. So it does provide a little bit more complexity over static routes. However, it does provide uh, robust and very, um, very good optimal routing and fast convergence. And it does all this dynamically based on that routing protocol's algorithm that is used. This is recommended for pretty much all environments, but really for some of the medium and large environments or networks that house multiple network devices and subnets. Some examples of dynamic routing would be RIP, OSPF, and EIGRP. Classful and classless. So let's talk about classful. Classful is something is, and certain routing protocols are either classful and slash or classless. A classful routing protocol would do the following. It follows the bit boundaries of a class A, a class B, and a class C. And some examples of a routing of a classful routing protocol would be RIP and EIGRP. Let's provide an example to help you understand what a classful um, behavior is. Let's say that we have configured on one of our interfaces 10.10.100.1. So that network would be 10.10.100.0/24. Now, based on bit boundaries, we know that this is a class A subnet because of the first octet, this is a 10, and that falls under a class A. Therefore, if we are configuring this with RIP, it would advertise that subnet as a class A, which is 10.0.0.0 slash 8 because it is a class A subnet. Classless does mm, kind of the opposite. It follows what is used for the subnet mask to understand what is the network segment. Some classless routing protocols would be OSPF and EIGRP, which we see listed here again. We'll talk about that later. An example, using the same example, is if we configured 10.10.100.0 slash 24, it would advertise it as 10.10.100.0 slash 24 because the subnet mass is indicating what that network is, the network portion for that route. Administrative distance. So this is a feature or, or a concept that is used to determine which routing protocol would inject the best route into the global routing table. When host A, for example, wants to communicate with host B and that request goes to its local router, is looking at its routing table. We will quickly learn that there are other routing tables for OSPF and EIGRP but it's the global routing table that the router is looking at for making its determination on how to route to the next possible hop or path. The lowest administrative distance between two routing protocols wins. Here's an example of some of the administrative distance numbers for some of the protocols, and there are a lot more. Static route has a uh, admin distance of one. EIGRP is 90, OSPF is 110, and RET would be 120. So, another example, if EIGRP and OSPF 
OSPF are both learning 10.10.100.0 slash 24. EIGRP would win and would inject that best possible path into the global routing table. Types of dynamic routing. So there are four main types. There is distance vector, link state, hybrid, and path vector. Let's talk about some of these things. One of the concepts for distance vector is that for that routing protocol, it would advertise its full routing table, changes or not, every certain interval number of time. There are no neighbor or topology tables that are built for a distance vector routing protocol. The link state kind of solves a lot of, the, um, lot of the faults with a distance vector. It does maintain neighbors so it knows about you know, which routers uh, it, it needs to communicate to for exchanging route information. And it also contains a topology table where it learns about the entire network and uses its algorithm to determine the best possible path. Link state routing protocols also will only advertise routing changes and not the entire routing table. A hybrid is basically a combination of both a distance vector and a link state routing protocol. A path vector, very briefly, is used by BGP to determine the best path using one of many attributes, which we will talk briefly on the slide for BGP. So let's talk about some of the routing protocols. So for the next three slides, this is kind of the, um, the categories that we have to find it as. We will, we will indicate the routing type, we'll indicate the algorithm, the metric, the hop limit, and other details of kind of providing a summary of what that routing protocol does. So RIP is a distance vector class fault routing protocol. There's two versions of it. There's version one and version two. Version two, if it needs to be used, is recommended over version one. Version 2 um, provides things such as route authentication. The algorithm that RIP uses is basically is defined as really a distance vector. But the algorithm that is associated with RIP, that which, which is what it uses, is called Bellman Ford. In terms of metrics, so metrics is basically the ability of providing a method of knowing the best possible route between another route. And for RIP, it uses basically hops. And basically, there's a limit of the number of hops before, well, we got a problem, and that is 15 hops. So let's say, for example, we have about 17 routers. That means that it's a pretty large environment. I mean, I've been in large environments before, and we don't really have 15, 16 routers. But it all depends, especially for why they're in network. So if I am trying to talk from host A to host B, and between us is 17 routers, basically that exceeds the 15 hops, and basically that... Um, nothing's going to be routed. The request is going to be dropped or expired. Um, just like uh, what a distance vector routing protocol does in terms of updates, RIP will send its full routing table every 30 seconds, whether there's a change or not. RIP does not contain its own neighbor or topology table. Its administrative distance is 120. So if there are other routing protocols configured, such as OSPF or EIGRP, RIP would definitely be on the lower end of being chosen, of injecting into the actual routing table. When to use RIP? Well, I would recommend to avoid RIP um, wherever possible. I got involved in a project that was completely all RIP based and they were having tons 